Good morning, everyone. Lovely to be here. I thank you uh, for having me. Um, I started most of my speeches uh, for as long as I can remember with, with what I'm about to say next. And I keep saying to myself, well, I'm going to have to find something new to say. But it becomes more relevant every time I say it. And it's the point that the period of time we're living through now is the fastest pace of change that any of us have ever experienced. In fact, that anyone in human history has ever experienced before. But it's the slowest pace of change you'll ever experience again. And that's, that's kind of the one-two punch, isn't it? It's, wow, yeah, it's really exciting. It's incredible. I'm, I'm struggling to keep up with all of it. But it'll never be this slow again. And if you look back at, over your own life, and you know, especially since the sort of late 1980s, when the wonderful other Gordon, Gordon Moore of Intel, uh, came up with his law, which is uh, you know, still, in, it's still as valid today as it was when he first came up with it in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, which is every 18 months, the density that we could put onto a silicon chip, and he was thinking about lithography at the time, will double, and effectively mean that the price will effectively half every 18 months. And that rule has continued from that day to this. That's one of those crazy exponential curves where you have to take you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the y-axis and put a logarithmic scale on it because it makes no sense because it just at some point just goes so vertical, human brains can't comprehend it. And in fact, it has been quite incomprehensible just the, the innovation that we've gone through. Um, and that point that the pace of change will never be this slow again, we're going to see doubling every 18 months and actually, driven by the revolution that's facing us now, it may accelerate even faster. So let me talk you th briefly through the three revolutions that I think I've lived through. Um, the first one is this, the microcomputer revolution. Uh, for those that are old enough, you might remember that computers uh, back in the uh, 1960s and the 1970s were the domain of lab-coated academics and, and engineers who, if you were lucky enough to get anywhere near one, you'd deliver a pile of punched cards, and maybe two weeks later or a month later, they'd deliver you a piece of paper with the answer. That was the, that was the height of computer interaction uh, you know, back in those days. And then suddenly, because of Go Moore's law, because of Gordon Moore's prediction and Intel's hard work and, and others, Motorola et al., um, these chips suddenly became commodities that anyone could afford. Um, and that led to the PC revolution. In, in the UK, and it's worth talking about the UK at this point, um, and Scotland in particular in a second, um, we were on a slightly different path than most, and, and actually quite a typically British, boffany kind of way. And it was, at the time, led out of Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, in Cambridge, you had the incredibly successful Herman Hauser, uh, who went on to found Acorn Microcomputers, which was the BBC microcomputer, which huge government and BBC initiative to put those into every school to teach every kid coding because we thought in the mid-1980s this would be vital. Why didn't we listen to ourselves uh, and continue that on? But over, not, uh, over actually the road in Cambridge was one of Britain's classic entrepreneurial sort of maybe a, a, he was a sort of darling of, of, of the Tory entrepreneurial push at the time uh, in Clive Sinclair. And Clive was much more your in the garden shed, what can I knock out for 50p kind of uh, technologists and being a bit unfair to him, but he did incredible things. Um, and this was probably his, the pinnacle of his career was the ZX Spectrum. Um, and the ZX Spectrum's incredibly important in the world, of, in, in the history of technology, because really the modern computer games industry as we know it today, and especially in the UK, happened because of this machine and happened because of ubiquity. You know, this was, about 199 pounds. So at the time, not cheap, but way more affordable than thousands and thousands of pounds for an office-based system. Um, and the one quirk of fate uh, which turned Dundee's fortunes on its head was that Sir Clive Sinclair chose Timex Corporation in Dundee to be the manufacturing location for the Spectrum. So fortunately, the build quality wasn't always particularly good on the Spectrums. And if it had a little crack in the case or a bent key or something wasn't quite right, you could acquire it out the back door of the factory for around about 10 pounds and a packet of Embassy Regal to the right uh, storeman. Um, obviously, completely legitimately, they were being, throw, they were being trashed otherwise. It was, it was reuse and regeneration before it was trendy. Um, but genuinely, there was 
absolute ubiquity of Spectrum ownership in Dundee at the time. I mean, I had five of them, I think. Um, you know, everyone I knew, all my friends had them, you know, crossed gender divides, crossed you know, social divides, everything. And when you have that level of ubiquity of access to a technology, some people will start to work out what they can do with it to their own benefit. And hence the computer games industry, as we know it in Dundee today, uh, was born. And thank you, uh, Gordon, for pointing out that Duke Jam and journalism was the three J's of Dundee. We obviously have now created the fourth, which is joysticks. Um, but the personal computer revolution did change the world, completely changed how many jobs were done, uh, you know, things like bookkeeping, accountancy, all these things which we take for granted today. Where would we be without a computer on every desktop? When Bill Gates said that was his mission for Microsoft, people laughed at him. People thought, there was no, there was no way, you, you didn't need that. You know, at one point, one of the senior uh, heads of IBM a couple of decades before had predicted that the, the human race could maybe use three, maybe four computers because they were all going to get so big and be so centralised. Um, the revolution did caught IBM actually, although they were, you know, should have been an enormous beneficiary of it. It was Microsoft uh, that really came out of there. The second one was when we connected them all together. And again, there's a brilliant British part to the story. Uh, you know, the defence agency in the US, Department of Defence, DARPA, uh, really created the, the internet as we know it, uh, you know, through procurement, through connecting. And it was all that whole thing of how do we create a fault tolerant network that isn't the IBM vision, that there's one single machine that could get blown up. Uh, you know, if, if it's clusters go down here, they'll appear elsewhere. That was the idea behind why we needed a technology like TCP IP and, and, and an internet enabled uh, world. Then the fabulous British uh, scientist Sir Tim Berners-Lee realised that on this network, academia could share papers in a way that they never had with a technology called hypertext. Um, and there's a brilliant book actually just written by uh, Edinburgh's own Ian Ritchie, uh, one of Scotland's technology pioneers, about how he turned down Tim Berners-Lee when he came and asked him to write a, a browser for the World Wide Web. Ian didn't think it would catch on. Um, I think there's a theme from some of the things Gordon was saying earlier about being blindsided to, to the next generation and what's coming. Uh, but we all know just how this has transformed our lives in every way possible. You know, an, an utter revolution about how we live our lives today. Uh, you know, we would not be having even a debate about things like hybrid working were it not for the internet. Uh, you know, just think about those things for a second. But we're at the cusp of the third revolution that I've lived through. Um, it wasn't non-fungible tokens or cryptocurrency, no matter how hard people would try and push their scheme to you for that. Um, it is AI, but it's not AI. AI doesn't look like this. Everybody worries that AI looks like this. I'm in, a, I'm in the, the room waiting for my job interview and the guy with the black briefcase is gonna take it from me. It's not that. It kind of looks something a bit more like this. It's, a, it's an opportunity to unleash human creativity in a way that's never been possible before. To again put it in the context of where we sit today, Edinburgh has, if not the oldest, one of the, they, they argue about it all the time, one of the two oldest AI research institutes in the world. It's 60 years old this year, Edinburgh AI. 60 years, we've pretty much known, probably for 40 or 50 of those, all the technologies that, we're, that you're seeing today become useful. But the difference is we didn't have the technology platforms to make them useful. Uh, today, because of Gordon Moore, yet again, his prediction and, and the whole industry's application of that, these AI techniques, these, these AI algorithms are solving problems at rates that we cannot comprehend. I mean, Google DeepMind, which incidentally was co-founded uh, by Demis Hassabis, who spent his whole earlier career as a games developer and it took a whole bunch of his games team into DeepMind with him. Uh, was right, is right at the forefront of things like protein folding simulation, which will allow drug discovery to exponentially transform forever the speed of which we can find new applicable compounds to treat uh, novel, uh, you know, novel uh, issues. But that brain is the brain that we need to develop. And this is really the point I'm gonna spend my last five minutes talking to you about. Um, this revolution's unstoppable. Uh, you've seen the debacle in the press about whether Sam Altman should have been removed as CEO and because he, he wasn't prepared to commit to, uh, to certain 
standards of altruism or whatever it was that went on. I, I'm not going to enter into that debate other than to say that the genie has been out the bottle for 60 years. It was just waiting for the technology to appear. So yes, we can legislate, yes, we can be sensible, but what we really need to do if we want to have an incredible future here in Scotland, and let's bring it straight back to us, is to embrace this with everything that we have. Technology skills are more important than they have ever been. And Mark's mentioned uh, challenges that are out there with computing. Uh, it's horrific, absolutely horrific, the, the, the crisis we have, and we need to solve it. I do believe, though, that AI will be our friend for this. AI-directed learning will deliver what Curriculum for Excellence promised. Because Curriculum for Excellence is a fantastic idea. We just don't have the system to be capable of delivering it. Well, it's going to come. Whether we like it or not, the system will be here. And what everyone needs to do is work out what that means to them and how do they embrace it. Within this country, again, it's been a brilliant setup. You know, Heather did an incredible job of laying out you know, just how well we punch above our weight at a higher education level, just how well educated the core, you know, the, the core Scottish population are. But it's not good enough. And in many ways, you know, taking ourselves out of Pisa or whatever, it's a terrible thing not to mark our homework and try and do better. It's a terrible thing to close an attainment gap if we're not making the top end of that attainment even better compared to everything that's going on in the world. Because we're the only ones looking inward in Scotland. The rest of the world doesn't care. The rest of the world will come here. Investment will come here, you've heard it. Companies will come here. Talent will come here if, this is how, if we have the right ingredients for an AI-powered future. And what are those ingredients? Beyond technical, and this is where I think Scotland has an enormous opportunity, it's creative. It's absolutely creative. It's storytelling, it's art and design, um, it's music, it's computer games. All of these technologies are what AI will enable. No one, in my view, will lose their job to AI. They'll lose their job to someone who's using AI efficiently. Because it's tools like we've seen before, tools that have come on time immemorial. If, if you were a bunch of horse and cart drivers at the turn of the 20th century, and I said to you, you won't lose your job to a lorry, you'll lose your job to somebody who can drive a lorry, so go out and get a driving license. You'd think I was pretty sensible. Well, you might actually, if you were a car, but that'll never catch on. Who's coming with a lorry? Smelly things. They're not, they're not, horses produce manure. They're, they're much more reliable, which they were for a time, and then not. It's the same situation. Every single one of us is a horse and cart driver. And if we don't start learning how to drive a lorry, we are absolutely stuffed. What does that mean for education? Well, I don't have enough time to give you my view on what it is. I think you can start to work it out yourselves. But what it is, is it's that. It's, it's the whole, we've got to create brains that can do this. We do have to, as my orange juice inspired walk on music said, rip it up and start again. You know, we do have to think the unthinkable because when we don't, other people will and they'll take leaps and bounds ahead of us at the time. This is a great time to be alive. It's a great time to be doing things like this. We have incredible initiatives from things like the Edinburgh Futures Institute that's just about to open in the old hospital building uh, next to the main university campus. Fantastic idea to cr for cross-disciplinary collaboration around all these areas, amazing. Last week in Dundee, we launched, well, we did it in London, but we launched the Arts and Humanities Research Council's biggest ever grant, uh, 76 million over the next five years. You know, they're used to giving small arts-related grants to universities throughout the country, uh, arts and humanities-related grants. This one is called CoStar. It's four centres, Pinewood uh, in, in the home counties, Belfast, Wakefield and Dundee. And the Dundee centre, uh, I'm fortunate enough to say, is in my building because we're taking a space which is coexistent with game studios and creative studios, University of Aberteer putting in a new research centre into the building and we're going to create the next generation of technologies for vir virtual film and television and games production. So all these techniques which you've seen in things like the Mandalorian, Star Wars Mandalorian, where now they don't build sets in real life, they build them in virtual reality in games engines um, and they project them onto screens that the actors act in front of. Far more productive, you can do incredibly exciting things with it. Dundee is going to have you know, one of the UK's biggest centres for that. But seeing AHRC take that leap of faith into something they're you know, probably truly uncomfortable with is brilliant because these are the catalysts. 
the Edinburgh Futures Institute. These are the catalysts that are going to transform our country. And that's what we need to, to communicate to our politicians, to our universities. Not that we need them to do it for us, because they can't. We as business, we as the, the, the communities, as the citizens, we need to demand the, the absolute culture of innovation, of creativity, and of optimism and ambition. Because that's the thing I'm going to leave you on. If we sit and say, well, maybe we can have a 10 million fund. Oxford raised a 1.2 billion fund over the last decade to fund spin-outs entirely privately. University didn't put a pound in. The government didn't put a pound in. It's the big pension funds. It's the sovereign wealth funds. It's massive global investors decided that Oxford, tiny little Oxford, was a great bet. Well, if Oxford's a, a billion pound bet, surely Scotland's a five billion pound bet. And that's the ambition that we've got to take out to the world and absolutely then deliver on with our talent. And I believe we can. Thank you very much.